Attention duped masses! You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Pilato. It's Deep Focus. Suddenly, Sinatra's original assassination film. With the inauguration coming up next week and threats of riots in the news, plus massive marijuana giveaways, and also that question of who the designated successor or designated survivor will be. Those are both different topics for different show. We want right here to take a look at a 1954 film that fell into public domain so it's available everywhere. Suddenly. It stars Frank Sinatra in his first presidential assassination movie as the Manchurian candidate wouldn't come out for another eight years in 1962. According to author Tom Santapietro's 2008 book, Sinatra in Hollywood, Sinatra had asked United Artists to withdraw the film from circulation because he discovered that Lee Harvey Oswald had seen it. Now, we can link to that book in Google Books, and the links will be provided. And again, everything we say and play included in the show notes, not only in this Morning Monarchy episode, but also on the posting of Deep Focus on suddenly on MediaMonarchy.com. Starts on page 147 of Sinatra in Hollywood. Basically moving from one successful thing to other shows. In fact, on to other shows would be putting it mildly, given the unceasing level of activity Sinatra was about to undertake in Hollywood. Frank now had no fewer than five feature films, most of them glossy, multi-million dollar extravaganzas lined up back to back, but first was the gritty, fascinating Suddenly. It was a film that marked the beginning of Sinatra's association with United Artists, a working relationship that would result in nine movies. Suddenly may look like a small film that was made as filler for a double bill, but it just so happened to star the then hottest property in show business, and not so incidentally. Turned out to be a terrific little film. The script attracted Sinatra because he found the depiction of a cold-blooded killer trying to assassinate the president for money to be a challenge. I've never seen on the screen any character as consistently brutal as this man is. Coming hard on the heels of From Here to Eternity, Suddenly's unremittingly dark aura wreaked havoc with Sinatra's wished-for career track of following a drama with a comedy and then a musical. But fortunately, Sinatra let the material, rather than a preordained plan, dictate the schedule. The resulting film tightened and grossing, and the exact opposite of From Here to Eternity in certain ways. It's small, not sprawling. Registering is nearly stage-bound in the use of one location, and Sinatra essays a completely unsympathetic character rather than a crowd-pleaser like Maggio. One thing, however, remained the same. It's a compelling film and features a terrific performance by Sinatra. Upon the film's release, Newsweek, Newsweek, wrote a rave review with special kudos reserved for Frank. As simple and startling as a good scream, Sinatra becomes one of the most repellent killers in American screen history. More to the point, it marked the start of Sinatra's dramatic career on film as a leading man. There was no Burt Lancaster or Montgomery Clift in sight now. This was the Frank Sinatra show, pure and simple, a feature film that turned into a one-man showcase as soon as he appeared on screen. Suddenly does not constitute film noir per se, the setting is not the mean streets of the urban world, none of the action takes place at night, and the lighting doesn't particularly define the space, frame, or characters themselves. At the same time, however, it does share some of the characteristics of the film noir genre that flourished in the post-war years. The characters are alienated, trapped in a world where the old cultural certainties have vanished. The supposedly friendly and secure small town of Suddenly is invaded by a hired assassin. The heroine has lost her husband to the violence of war and is so unsure of herself and her place in this new world that she babies her young son as a means of protecting him. What the film also shares in common with the smaller noir pictures is an extremely lean running time, 77 minutes, and a concern with money as a rotting obsession at the core of the story. True to its B-movie origin, suddenly bolts out of the gate immediately. Richard Sale's script, which appears to have been inspired by President Eisenhower's train trips to Palm Springs, California, immediately establishes that Sheriff Todd Shaw, played by Sterling Hayden, is in love with Ellen Benson, Nancy Gates, mother of a young boy rather oddly named Pidge, named by Kim, played by Kim Charney. Ellen, still grieving for her husband killed in the war, considers his death to have been a horrific waste of life. Ellen and Pidge live with her father-in-law, Pete Pop Benson, played by James Gleason, a former Secret Service bodyguard for President Calvin Coolidge. Unlike daughter-in-law Ellen, Benson wears his patriotism front and center and condones certain types of violence. Guns aren't necessarily bad, depends on who uses them. 
Everything in this small, somnolent town is about to change, however, because the president's train's passing through, and the president will detrain in order to get into a car. The president of the United States is coming to town, and so is would-be presidential assassin John Barron Sinatra. Introducing himself as an FBI agent, Barron ingratiates himself into the Benson household in a low-key fashion, telling the three occupants that he's making sure that their house on the hill is perfectly safe because of rumors of an assassin wanting to fire on the president. Just one problem. Barron himself is the assassin, and within minutes of his arrival, he and two henchmen, Benny and Bart, have revealed their true colors. When Carney, a real FBI agent, shows up at the house, Barron kills the agent, wounds the sheriff, and casually mentions he will cut the throat of young Pidge if cooperation does not ensue. This Johnny Barron is one psycho killer intended to take out the president himself with nary a second thought. He's in it for the money, and in his own words, I have no idea who's behind the assassination. I don't know, and I don't want to know. When an incredulous pops appeals to Johnny's patriotism, but you're an American citizen. Johnny's cynical answer is, after one minute after five, I'll be a very rich American citizen. Never once does Sinatra ask for audience sympathy, bragging about his record in World War II, taking credit for a silver star, and the killing of dozens of Germans, his eyes grew brighter, his manner ever more intense. Johnny's on the verge of becoming unhinged, and to Sinatra's credit, one actually believes this character, who could easily have slipped into caricature. The slight figure is one unpleasant loser and a man who casually, and with great pleasure, utilizes the power derived from his gun. He's also a man who keeps his hat on indoors for nearly the entire brief running time, perhaps because Sinatra's sensitivity about his increasingly bald head. He may be dwarfed by the physically imposing Sterling Hayden, but the slight Johnny in figure of the alarmingly thin Sinatra is one tough customer. He straightens Sheriff Todd's fracture with his bare hands, actually enjoys the pain he is causing, belts Pidge to the floor when the boy accuses him of stealing the Silver Star, and casually states he would easily kill any of the Bensons, he just doesn't like not getting paid for it. With his sinewy, tightly wound body, Sinatra's physicality reveals a man on the edge, as M.A. Schmidt, the Hollywood correspondent for the New York Times, reported after watching Sinatra during filming, he tenses, but the tension is caused by concentration, not by uncertainty. When the action was over, his whole body seemed to melt into relaxation. Like any first-class actor, Sinatra conveys volumes of information through a subtle movement of his eyes, precisely delineating his character's combination of psychosis and overweening confidence. The smallest physical movements all speak to that same psychosis, the sudden sharp hand gestures suggesting the barely suppressed violence of a seriously disturbed character. The public's perception of Sinatra as a man of seemingly great charm who had become engaged at women's notice helped to reinforce the reaction to his acting herein. On a larger scale, Barron's barely suppressed hysteria neatly dovetails with the neurotic 1950 underpinnings of the film and the age of anxiety in the mid-50s audiences were living through. In the wake of the atom bomb, nothing could be taken for granted, a jittery state of affairs which had led to the rise of film noir. Suddenly may not constitute film noir, but it's every bit as metaphorically dark as those classic film noir films. Small town California has been invaded by presidential assassins, and nothing's the same. Nothing's safe. There's a tight claustrophobic look and feel to the film which enhances its rather ruthless efficiency. Both the direction by Lewis Allen and the effective cinematography by Charles G. Clark makes this film a grim black-and-white town that cannot escape the increasingly violent present. In 1954, when Suddenly was filmed, the threat of communism was in the air and the Korean War had ended just one year previously. A sense of violence suffuses the film on every level. Whether it's an attempted assassination, pacifists resorting to the use of guns, or violence invading the safe sanctuary of home, there's no escaping the danger. Johnny's clipped dialogue refers to the lingering after effects of the war. I learned to kill in the war. Only I can do the job because I have no feelings. Feelings are a weakness that make you think of something besides yourself. It's as if Sinatra's Johnny is a Nazi transported to American citizenhood. When you have a gun, you're sort of a god. The first time I got my hands on a gun, I was somebody. Aside from a few obligatory shots of the town suddenly and one gunfight between Johnny's henchmen and the police, all the film takes place within the confines of the Benson home. It's an oppressive atmosphere which helps reinforce the feeling of being trapped. Those living in suddenly are captives, as is Johnny himself. In classic B-movie fashion, backstory is sketched in with just a few declarative sentences. Barron speaks of his alcoholic father and unmarried mother. Ergo, the audience is supposed to believe that such crazy men are raised that way. 
Johnny Psycho credits having been firmly established, the final 45 minutes of the film unfold in real time as lingering shots of the clock approaching 5 p.m. reinforce the president's impending doom. Having bolted a rifle to the table in order to shoot the president, as soon as he leaves the train, Johnny spits out the chilling command to his accomplices, let's go to work. Quentin Tarantino deliberately pays homage to those words before the robbery sequence in Reservoir Dogs. At the film's climax, Johnny's accomplice Bart is electrocuted after the Bensons ground the faulty wire television set. Locked to his rifle, he can't stop firing bullets before the president's 5 p.m. arrival. The train barrels through town right on schedule but doesn't stop. Face contorted by disappointment, Johnny wheels around from the rifle, screaming his frustration. He is shot first by the no longer pacifist Ellen and then by Sheriff Todd. The ensuing image of Johnny lying dead on the floor is just one more eerie parallel to the nine years later shooting of President John F. Kennedy by Lee Harvey Oswald. Not only are the rifles employed in the shooting similar, but Johnny himself is killed, just as Jack Ruby killed Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald. In fact, according to Sinatra chronicler Daniel O'Brien, around 1970, Sinatra discovered that alleged solo Kennedy assassin Lee Harvey Oswald had watched the film just a few days before the Dallas slaying on 22nd November 1963. Still shocked by the episode and slowly turning more politically conservative, Sinatra felt that such inflammatory material should not be in the public domain and withdrew suddenly from circulation. As a result, there were no further network television showings and this ban was not lifted until the 1980s, the late 1980s. The assassin's been killed, but Ellen seems every bit as unsettled as she was at the film start, even if by necessity she's now embraced the culture of violence by shooting Johnny. There seems to be no escape from the bloodshed that has been passed through three generations. With Johnny dead, the plot's loose ends are tied up in world record time, but in rather strange fashion at that. Consider the film's fade out. The presidential assassination has been foiled. Nancy is turned into a gunslinging mall. There's a dead psycho on the living room floor, and she has just one key question. Can I pick you up for church? Sheriff Todd says, that'd be swell. Fade to black. To which the viewer can only respond, huh? After all the catastrophic events that have occurred, this is how it ends. It's a weirdly upbeat bit of dialogue with which to conclude a paranoid little thriller. But true to its roots, the lingering shots of suddenly at film's end make the town look as unfriendly, depressed, and cold as ever. That's the portion from the 2008 book Sinatra in Hollywood by Tom Santopietro. Now, it's also worth noting that an entertainment television show called Backstage did a piece in 2008 on the similarities between Suddenly and Manchurian Candidate. Forty-four years ago this week, the nation was stunned by the shocking and tragic assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Rumors and conspiracy theories surrounding the case continue to this day. Tim Estilos is here to shed some light on a persistent Hollywood rumor that is not only connected to the assassination, but also a lost piece of film history. Tim? Barry, singer Frank Sinatra was considered to be a good friend of President Kennedy. And some believe after JFK's death, Sinatra was so devastated by the tragedy, he tried to quash a couple of his own films he made years before that had assassination plot lines. One of those movies could be considered Sinatra's forgotten film. My grandpa said I'd see New York in all its beauty and its power From the city's highest spot atop the famous Woolworth Tower This is the Frank Sinatra we all know and love on film. Smooth, suave, and entertaining. Whether as a singing, dancing sailor on shore leave in On the Town. I told my grandpa I wouldn't miss on any. We got just one day. Gotta see the whole town right from Yonkers on down to the bay. In just one day. Or planning an impossible Las Vegas heist in the original Ocean's Eleven. Uh, one minute and 38 seconds after midnight, we black out the whole town and hit the five casinos at the same time. Sahara, Riviera, Desert Inn, the Sands, and the Flamingo. Nobody will even see us. Or even stealing the movie in his Academy Award winning role as Maggio in From Here to Eternity. Watch out for Fatso. He'll try to crack you. And if they put you in a hole, don't yell. Don't make a sound. You'll still be yelling when they come to take you out. 
All the Sinatra roles and many more were in films the legendary talent was immensely proud of. But Hollywood rumor has it, the assassination of JFK on November 22nd, 1963, prompted Sinatra to use his clout in Tinseltown to hide two of his most dramatically powerful films from the public eye because their plot lines involved political assassination. The Kennedy assassination was a national trauma every bit as, as shocking and, and horrific as 9-11. I mean, the whole country was just stunned. And in the years after President Kennedy was uh, murdered in Dallas, the films were not shown. The most popular explanation, the urban myth, if you will, was that Frank Sinatra had personally ordered that the films not be shown. One of these films was The Manchurian Candidate, which focused on a Korean war hero brainwashed to assassinate a presidential contender. You are to shoot the presidential nominee through the head, and Johnny will rise gallantly to his feet and lift Ben Arthur's body in his arms, stand in front of the microphones and begin to speak. Sinatra plays the potential assassin's friend who tries but fails to stop him. Poor friendless, friendless Raymond. He was wearing his medal when he died. Despite Manchurian Candidate's shocking assassination plotline, some film historians believe the rumors of Sinatra quashing that film's circulation after JFK's death are pure speculation. I've never come across anything that I considered authoritative, that, that Sinatra was disowning the film, wanted to suppress the film, regretted ever having made the film. However, in 1954, years before The Manchurian Candidate, Sinatra made a similar assassination film that unintentionally foreshadowed the tragic fate of JFK. In the film titled Suddenly, Sinatra plays a cold-blooded killer planning to assassinate a fictional U.S. president from a window with a long-range bolt-action rifle. I can do it, and I'm going to do it. But you're an American citizen. Sure. And one minute after five, I'm going to be a very rich American citizen. Suddenly showed a Sinatra filmgoers never saw before as a ruthless, amoral, and psychopathic assassin. I got no feeling against the president. I'm just earning a living. By treason. Ace those craps. Don't give me that politics, Jazz. It's not my racket. I don't even know who's paying me, and I don't want to know. What's the difference? This is part of Sinatra's comeback. From Here to Eternity was his big comeback film. This is the one he does right after. And he's trying to show he's an actor. He's trying to get away okay. from the, the happy-go-lucky singing roles. It's not just a man. It's the president. That's what's so funny. The laugh is on the guys who are paying the freight. All this loot, and they don't even know what they're doing. A half a million clams for absolutely nothing. Because tonight at 5 o'clock, I kill the president. One second after 5, there's a new president. What changes? Nothing. There are facts that tend to support the rumor that Sinatra tried to keep suddenly from film audiences after JFK's assassination. For one, the film was rarely seen in theaters or on TV to this day, and the studio uncharacteristically failed to renew the film's copyright. I think Manchurian Candidate and Suddenly just got caught up in this feeling of, let's be sensitive, let's, let's not get anybody upset about anything. Also, in both Kitty Kelly's biography of Sinatra and Vincent Bugliosi's detailed examination of JFK's assassination titled Reclaiming History, both authors claim Sinatra quashed suddenly after hearing that Lee Harvey Oswald had watched the film only days before he killed JFK. Bugliosi believes the film may have even influenced Oswald. But unlike real-life history, Sinatra's fictional assassin is killed before he can carry out his deadly plan. It didn't stop. It didn't stop! <laughs> no. Don't. No. Please, no. 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 
Wherever the truth lies regarding Sinatra's involvement and suddenly his public availability in the 1960s, it's reported he rarely spoke about the film in the years following JFK's death. And Barry, I've got to tell you, this film, as popular as Sinatra's films are as a whole, this is the only one that few people know about. The basis for believing that Oswald may have watched it, I gather, came from a interview that Oswald's wife gave to a reporter. Is that correct? Yes, she had told this reporter that she observed her husband to watch suddenly on a number of occasions, and every time it came on, he would lean forward and really watch the film very, very intently. And the similarities are really kind of spooky. It's this. Uh, one man who is disaffected with his country, who had served in the military, who has a bolt-action rifle making a long shot. What are some of the other? Well, uh, this, let's start with the rifle. It's a foreign-made rifle in both real life as well as in the film. Um, he's wanting to shoot the president in a limousine as he's arriving in this particular town. One of the killers that works with Sinatra in the film shoots a policeman who stops him on the street to sort of investigate it. And as we know in real life, Oswald shot Officer Tippett and killed him shortly after the assassination. So there's a number of And it's of set in a, a western, southwestern sort of town, could be Texas. Yeah, there's all kinds of uh, comparisons to be made. And this movie, if people are interested in this movie, you can get it on eBay for about $5 plus shipping because it's so cheap because it went out of uh, copyright and it's in public domain. Public domain. There's all kinds of video companies that are making this available, so anybody can pick it up now. Thanks, Tim. Interesting story. Deep Focus. Suddenly, Sinatra's assassination film. You're listening to Media Monarchy with James Evan Filato. Since 2005, Media Monarchy has covered the real news about politics, health, technology, and the occult. All remixed with music and media that matters. Go to MediaMonarchy.com slash support and become a monthly subscriber so you can help keep independent, non-commercial, alternative media going and growing. Thanks.